Hey everybody, okay, this is gonna be a good one. What I've got here, and this is gonna be a mouthful, is the new three rail O-scale Southern Pacific Krauss Mafi ML4000 diesel hydraulic locomotive. It's made by Third Rail, and we're gonna check it out right now on Eric's Trains. All right, so for this unboxing from my knife collection, we'll be using this knife. This is a Topps Poker. There it is. Pretty cool looking knife. So we've got the Krauss Mafi ML4000 diesel hydraulic. I ordered this from Third Rail, oh, about this time last year in 2021, and it finally showed up here in March of 2022. So the way that third rail operates is that you have to reserve a model or else you pretty much aren't going to get one unless they just happen to have a couple unsold units after all the rest are sold. So here's the tag. Brass O-Scale Krauss Mafi ML4000 Diesel Hydraulic Southern Pacific and this is the three rail number two. And for those of you who don't know, Third Rail is a maker of O-scale trains, just like Lionel or MTH or Atlas. They're not as big as Lionel or MTH or Atlas, but they make some really cool stuff. And this is the second Third Rail locomotive that I now have in my fleet. I've been really excited about this arriving because I don't know if you've ever seen the Krauss Mafi, but it is a strange looking locomotive. Unlike any other American locomotive, and that's because they were made in Germany. Third rail. And by the way, in terms of pronunciation, I am saying Krauss Mafi. You could say Kraus Maffei as well, but I watched a German video, and in that video they said Kraus Maffei, so that's what I'm going to say. I'm not from Germany, so I'm doing the best I can. Nice. And we got that same tag on the box itself. We got third rail embossed in the styrofoam. Very cool. And here we go. Oh yeah, <laughs> wow, that is cool. And check out that cab. Now you see what I mean about this thing being very unusual, especially for American railroads. So let's get it up on the layout. Okay, so before we get started, I wanna deal with something that came up. I'm not sure if you could see when I was unboxing this locomotive, but the front pilot was actually bent under itself. What probably happened was at some point during shipping, somebody dropped the box and that caused the pilot to bend under itself. And you know, these things happen, that's life. These engines go on quite a long journey to get to our front doorsteps. And quite honestly, it's something of a small miracle that these things don't happen more often than they do. I mean, we are dealing with a finely detailed brass model. But anyway, I was able to bend the pilot back into shape as you can see, but as a result, some of the paint chipped off and you can see some of the exposed brass there and there's some on the other side as well. Now I do have some Southern Pacific gray touch-up paint that I could use, but you know, it's a brand new $1,400 model and I was a little bit upset about that. So I contacted Scott Mann over at Third Rail and I told him what happened and he was kind enough to send me a replacement pilot. And so all I have to do is undo a couple screws, pop off the old pilot and replace it with this nice shiny new pilot and it'll be good as new. However, I am not gonna be using either of these two pilots because also packaged with the engine when you buy it is this much more realistic looking scale pilot 
that can be used with a scale coupler. And so what you can do if you want to is remove the three rail pilot and the big three rail coupler and replace it with these scale counterparts and then the front of your locomotive will look much more realistic. Now I want to do that because I don't plan on putting anything in front of this locomotive. It's too beautiful for that. And so I'm fine with losing the functionality of that O-gauge coupler in exchange for a much more prototypical look. And so this is packaged with the engine when you buy it. They don't give you a scale coupler, but I do have some KD couplers on hand, and that's what I'll be using. And you may have seen me do this before when I was reviewing an Atlas F3 model a few years ago. On the Atlas F3s, you can also remove the front pilot and the front coupler and replace them with scale counterparts that are packaged in the box. And actually, Atlas gives you the scale coupler as well. However, on the Atlas model, that process is one way. You can't go back to the three rail setup. You actually have to use a Dremel tool to cut off that O-gauge coupler. And so you can't go back once you make the transition to the scale equipment. However, on the third rail model here, they've got a much more clever design and it is reversible. All you have to do is pop out a few screws and undo a Molex connector and you can pop off this pilot and the coupler and go to the scale equipment but if at some point down the road I decide, hey, I do want to double head this thing or run something in front of it, or if I want to sell it, I can always go back to the three rail pilot and the three rail coupler. Now I'm going to go ahead and show you the process of swapping out the pilot and the coupler on this locomotive. But if you don't want to watch this, you can go ahead and skip to the next chapter in this video. So first thing I want to do is remove the old equipment. So there's two screws to remove the pilot. And then the coupler is attached to a bracket and there's two screws to remove the bracket. There we go. And then the wires for the electrocoupler, they come out like that. There's a little Molex connector and that's it. And then we'll put the scale pilot in its place. All right, and now I'm gonna install a scale coupler right here. So also packaged with the locomotive are two of these brackets onto which you can mount the scale coupler. And they give you two because if you wanted to convert the rear coupler to a scale coupler, you could do that as well. And here's my coupler. This is a KDO scale coupler, the die cast metal variety. Hopefully I can get this thing together without losing the spring or getting it upside down or something like that. I'm not an expert with scale couplers. I don't work with them very often, so you'll have to forgive me if I'm not doing this in the most efficient or correct way possible. This is just for cosmetic purposes, so it's not really going to be used. There we go. Took me a little bit to figure out how this bracket works. <laughs> All right, there it is. And then we'll install it right here. And they give you a couple screws to secure that bracket in place. And there we go. And look how much better that looks. I really like that. It looks so much more realistic. And like I said, it's completely reversible. So I can always go back to the three rail coupler and pilot if I need to. All right, so now we can get on with the rest of the review, starting with a little bit of history on the real ML4000. The Krauss Maffei ML4000 was a road switcher diesel hydraulic locomotive that was built between 1961 and 1969 
by German manufacturer Krauss Maffei in Munich, Germany. So I'm going to be honest with you, I really don't know that much about diesel hydraulic locomotives, except to say that the main difference between a diesel hydraulic and a standard diesel locomotive is in the transmission. The diesel hydraulic locomotive uses a hydraulic transmission, whereas a standard diesel uses a more conventional mechanical transmission. But I really didn't get this model because it's a diesel hydraulic. I got it because as you can see, it looks unlike anything else in my fleet. Now, what really makes this locomotive interesting in my mind is that it was used by the Southern Pacific during an era when American railroads were mainly using American-built motive power. And you know, even today, most of our freight motive power is still American-made. And so for them to be using a German-made locomotive in the 1960s was really quite a departure from the norm at that time. So in the late 1950s, the Southern Pacific was experiencing growth in their freight service and this meant that their trains were getting longer and heavier and in some cases they would have to use up to 10 locomotives to power long distance trains with the majority of their workhorse diesels at that time being F7s or GP9s. So in the search for more efficient pulling power they began to experiment with diesel hydraulic locomotives and in October of 1961 the Southern Pacific received three ML4000 locomotives from German manufacturing Krauss Maffei. Each ML4000 was powered by two Maybach V16 diesel engines, which produced 3,540 horsepower total. The Denver Rio Grande also purchased three ML4000s, but eventually sold them to the Southern Pacific after they proved unsuitable for mountain service. The Southern Pacific also found the ML4000s unsuitable for mountain service over the Sierra Nevadas, and so they were eventually relegated to service in flat areas throughout California often paired with F7s and GP9s. But despite their inability to do mountain service, the ML4000s were fairly reliable with only one reported failure, and so the Southern Pacific eventually ordered a second batch of ML4000s. They ended up with a total of 18 ML4000s in their fleet, with three of them being the earlier cab unit design like we have here, and the rest being hood units. By 1969, all but one of the ML4000s had been scrapped. The surviving locomotive number 9113, which was originally numbered number 9010, was converted into a camera car whose purpose was to record films for a computerized locomotive simulator for engineer training. Kind of cool. The front of the locomotive was drastically changed to accommodate the cameras and to allow for collision protection. The camera car locomotive, which wound up with a final road number of 8799, was eventually retired from service in 1984. After its retirement, the camera car locomotive was donated to the California State Railroad Museum in Sacramento in 1986. They tried to do some restorations, but those didn't really work out, and eventually it was sold to the Pacific Locomotive Association, or the PLA, who assigned it the original road number of 9010, and in 2013 they began the process of finding replacement parts for the locomotive, as well as restoring the front of the locomotive to its original design prior to the camera car conversion. On the 14th of February 2017, the rear Maybach V16 diesel engine was successfully started after being unused for 48 years. And then on March 1st, 2017, Southern Pacific number 9010 operated under its own power for the first time on the Niles Canyon Railway. And then finally, on July 20th, 2019, number 9010 made its debut in excursion service. So now let's talk about Third Rail's rendition of the Krauss Maffei ML4000. So they announced this model a couple years ago, and then it finally arrived in early March 2022. Now, the way that Third Rail works is basically the way that Lionel works and Atlas works and MTH in that they will announce a new model and then they'll give you a window in which to reserve one, to pre-order one. You put a deposit down and then later on when the model arrives, you pay the remainder and they ship it to you. And that's what they did in this case. So if you want a third rail model, it's always best to pre-order one before they actually arrive because if you don't do it that way, you may not be able to get one. Now, 
Now, usually they have a few extras on hand, you know, canceled reservations and stuff like that. But to guarantee that you get one, it's always best to pre-order. And that goes for Lionel and Atlas and MTH as well. Anyway, Third Rail did six different versions of this model. They did the Southern Pacific body with the Southern Pacific paint scheme like you see here. They did a Denver Rio Grande body with a Denver Rio Grande paint scheme. They did a couple of Krausmify test units, one for Denver Rio Grande and one for Southern Pacific. They did a Southern Pacific body with a Denver Rio Grande paint scheme. And then they did a Denver Rio Rio Grande body with a Southern Pacific paint scheme. Yeah. Everybody got that? Let's go over some stats and facts on this model. So the overall length is 15 and a half inches. The weight is five pounds, seven ounces. When tested, this locomotive produced two pounds, two ounces of pulling power, which is right where I expected it to be for a single motored engine. And then the minimum curve needed to operate this locomotive is 054. The construction on this model is a combination of sheet metal, die cast metal, ABS plastic, and brass. So you've got a sheet metal frame, die cast metal for the trucks, truck side frames, and fuel tank. The body shell is ABS plastic plastic, and then all of the detail parts are brass. The cab is fully detailed on the inside, and I gotta say, it looks amazing in there. I haven't seen a cab interior that detailed since the Lionel Vision Line ES44 Hybrid or the Vision Line Genset Switcher. As you'll see in a moment, it looks outstanding in there. And in fact, all of the details on this model are first rate. This locomotive is driven by one large motor that's mounted right here in the middle above the fuel tank. And then through a series of universal joints, it drives all axles on both trucks, which is really nice. Now, just like other third rail models, the motor uses a belt drive system, but it's not some flimsy rubber belt that you would have to replace on a regular basis. It's sort of a fiber reinforced belt with teeth. It's extremely durable. And in fact, Scott Mann at third rail has told me in the past that these belts are designed to last for the entire lifetime of the model under normal conditions. I'll open this thing up in a few minutes and you'll get a good look Look at that belt drive system. Operationally, you've got two choices. Of course, you can operate this conventionally with nothing more than a transformer and some track, or you can run it with your TMCC or Legacy command systems. Now, on board, the command system is TMCC, not Legacy. So you've got a basic TMCC control. There's a rail sounds light package, which has some pretty good crew talk sounds and the horn and bell and so forth, but it's not quite as advanced as full on Legacy, uh, but it is very nice and it sounds great. Oh, and by the way, in case you've ever wondered why smaller manufacturers like Third Rail don't have the full Legacy package in their locomotives, well, it's because Lionel won't license out the full Legacy technology. They only license out basic TMCC and the Rail Sounds Light sound package. And of course, Lionel does this to keep an advantage over their competition. And so the way that Third Rail compensates for this is that, for one, they bring out models that Lionel has never done, and also they have more fine detailing on those models than you typically find on a Lionel model. And this is a perfect example. So it's kind of a trade-off. With Lionel, you get the best features and the best sounds, but the models may not have the most prototypical detailing, and they might not be the most unique models ever made. And then with Third Rail, yeah, they don't have all those fancy legacy features, but then again, nobody's ever done a model of the ML4000 in O-Scale, and it's also incredibly detailed. And speaking of detail, here's a close-up of the front of the locomotive. You've already seen the pilot area, but up here we've got lots of add-on grab irons. There's a headlight here. Then we've got a Mars light above that. We've got lighted number boards on either side. And above those, we've got operational marker lights. Here's a look at those die-cast metal truck side frames, and as you can see, they look outstanding. These are some of the most detailed truck side frames I've ever seen on an O-scale model. In the vicinity of the cab, we've got a bunch of nice grab irons up on the hood. We've got one on either side of the cab doors. There's a bunch up on the roof, and there's also a little add-on horn here. And then the cab doors open up, and they are sprung, so they'll snap back shut like that. The windows on the cab look spectacular. They're simulated weather stripping around the windshields, and they've got add-on wiper pieces as well. And then on the side windows, you've got this great silver trim, and then there's these little windscreen pieces. These are packaged with the engine when you buy it, and you have to install them yourself, 
and they're made of really thin metal. They're very delicate, so you have to be very careful. These could bend or break very easily, but they look amazing. And then check out the rear windows on the cab. It looks like a car or something. It's awesome. And then we've got the incredibly detailed cab interior. It is first rate, I'm telling you. It's one of the best I've ever seen, if not the best. And unfortunately, I'm not sure how well you're gonna be able to see it on the video, but I'll try my best. So you can see against the back wall of the cab, there's a light. And it's not just some LED that's hanging out, it's a light fixture, how cool is that? There are two hand-painted figures in the cab, and then you've got a very detailed control panel for the engineer, it looks great. And then of course the icing on the cake is that sort of institutional bluish green color, it looks awesome. Moving back, check out these cool porthole windows. There's six of them on each side of the locomotive and one on the back. They are blacked out so that you can't see through them, and that's a good thing because it prevents you from seeing all the wires and electronics on the inside. And then check out this really nice see-through metal vent up here. It looks great. Here in the middle of the ML4000, there's a lot going on. So down here, we've got this nicely detailed fuel tank, and there's some cast-in service panels and some piping. There's an add-on ladder, and then there's some legible signage right here that says fuel. And we've got some hand-painted details going on as well. And then we've got this door. And other than the two cab doors on this locomotive, all other doors are molded into the plastic body, so they don't open, but they are very nicely done because we've got this great looking molded in door handle, and then of course one of those porthole windows, and we've got the add-on metal grab irons on either side. There's a little lift ring right here, and then whatever this thing is, I don't know. Hey, can you tell I'm not an expert on the ML4000? I don't know what this thing is, but it looks great, and that just goes to show you, you don't have to be an expert on these locomotives to enjoy them. And moving toward the back, we've got another door with add-on grab irons on either side, a little add-on ladder back here with more grab irons. There's our road number, 9001. And then we've got another one of these who's what's it's up here. And I was kind of just kidding in the last scene. I'm sure this is an air intake of some sort, but again, I'm not an expert on the ML4000. I'm sure somebody is, and they'll probably fill us in in the comments below. Up on the roof behind the cab, we've got some nice add-on lift rings. And then here is one of the two operational smokestacks on this locomotive. Both smokestacks go down to a single fan-driven smoke unit. And what's cool is that these smokestacks are actually pretty nicely detailed because they've got these non-operational flaps that would normally cover the exhaust opening. It kind of reminds me of the exhaust flaps on the Genset Switcher, except these ones don't work. Now, when it comes time to load smoke fluid into the smoke unit, you don't want to pour smoke fluid directly down the stack like this. What you want to do is use this little piece that's packaged with the locomotive when you buy it and you stick it into the smokestack like that, and then you put your smoke fluid up here, and that will ensure that the smoke fluid goes down into the smoke unit without making a big mess. That was a nice touch. Beyond that, we've got this nice fan housing. You can see they've got some add-on piping going on and some lift rings, really nice mesh screen, and very detailed fan blades on the inside. Beyond that, we've got the second smokestack, and then we've got the rear fan housing, and this piece can be detached like so, and that reveals some engine controls. So up top, we've got a switch to toggle between conventional control and TMCC operation. Obviously, I've got mine on TMCC. Then we've got the run program switch to program the locomotive into our legacy or TMCC system. Then we've got the master volume control. And then right here is an included nine volt battery that's already in there when you buy the locomotive. This is only needed if you're gonna operate the locomotive conventionally. If you're using TMCC, this doesn't need to be there. I've left it in there for now because it doesn't do any harm having it in there, but I'll probably take it out at some point just so it doesn't corrode or leak or anything like that. Here's the underside of the ML4000. On either side of the fuel tank, you can see these universal joints that allow that single motor in the middle to drive all axles on both trucks. If we push on some of these drive wheels, they have a little bit of give, and that's because this locomotive has sprung drivers. Pretty cool. Then there are four traction tires, two here and two over here. And then finally, we've got these unique looking third rail, center rail pickup rollers that look unlike anybody else's center rail pickup rollers. They're kind of football shaped as opposed to cylinder shaped. And I don't know why third rail uses this design, but they do. And it gives their pickup rollers a unique look. 
And finally, I opened up the locomotive to give you a look at that unique belt drive system that Third Rail uses on all their locomotives. So here's the motor and here's the flywheel, and then there's the belt. And so you can see that when I turn the motor, it turns that belt, which in turn drives the gear down below that powers the trucks. Pretty cool. And this is the way that Third Rail does it on all their locomotives, or all the locomotives that I know of. But again, this is a very tough belt. It's kind of reinforced, and it's designed to last the entire lifetime of the model. It should never have to be replaced. And while we're in here, we can get a better look at that cab interior, and look at that, I was wrong. There are three hand-painted crew figures, not two. Boy, I'm really glad I opened this thing up because I just noticed something else. There are two speakers on this locomotive. There's one back here, and there's one here in front of the cab. That is really cool. All right, the last thing we're going to do before we start this thing up is BFIMO, best feature in my opinion. And of course, it's kind of a no-brainer. My favorite feature on the new Crossmify ML4000 is the cab area and the cab interior. It just looks incredible, and that cab interior is so nicely detailed. It's a home run any way you look at it. Okay, let's let her rip. So you can see the Mars light here, and then if I change direction, you can see the marker lights on there. And this little red light here is just decorative. There's no LED behind it, so that's why it's not on. So here's the horn. And here's the bell. And here's a sampling of some of the crew talk sounds. Now the track left. Are we clear? Over. Affirmative. The track is yours. Over. Roger that. All clear. Now. Dispatcher here. You're cleared onto the main. Over. Roger that. All clear. Now. And you've got several different RPM levels, so here's a sample of that. This thing's putting out a lot of smoke. Anyway, let's go ahead and move it out.
All right, so there you have it. The third rail Krauss Maffei ML4000 diesel hydraulic. A beautiful locomotive and certainly unlike anything else in my fleet. If you're looking for something different, well, you've found it. Now, the price on these is right at $1,400. Like I said, if you didn't pre-order one of these things, it might be hard to get one, but I think Third Rail still has a few of these available, and you can get them at thirdrail.com. If you'd like to support this channel, I would greatly appreciate it. That can be done through Patreon at patreon.com slash ericstrains. Patreon supporters get access to all sorts of perks and benefits, and you can read about those benefits on my Patreon page. I'd like to put a big thank you out there to all of my current Patreon supporters. Your support means the world not only to me, but to the future of this channel. And finally, if you'd like to buy an Eric's Trains t-shirt or anything else I might be selling, check out the Eric's Trains online store at ericstrains.com slash store. Anyway, that's it for now. I'm Eric Siegel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.